All right, here we go. Hebrews, the fifth chapter. And I'm just a little off here in a sense that I got to go back. I'm trying to set up some scriptures because I have a lot of them. And uh, we are in Hebrews, right? You know, I always like to start off by reading, sometimes reading the last part of the last chapter. Well, first in chapter three, I'm going to say this again. You know, the first chapter, the third, third chapter, the first verse, it says, it says, acquaint yourself immediately and fully with Christ Jesus as the ambassador and the chief priest as our confession. Okay. So remember, this is to the Jewish people, this book. So that's the context. He's talking to Jewish people again. And the temple worship still going on. The temple has not been torn down yet. At 70 AD, that's when that happened, the rebellion. And so the last chapter, last couple of verses in four, maybe I'll start in the verse 14. It says, in the message of the incarnation, incarnate, carne means flesh, God living in Jesus and living now in you. We have the son of God, Jesus, the son of God, representing who? Mankind in the highest place of spiritual authority. That which God has spoken to us in him is the final word. I love that. It's the final word. There's no more word coming. It's the final word. The incarnation is the final word. It echoes now in our conversation. As high priest, ambassador and high priest, as high priest, he fully identifies with us in the context of our frail human lives because he became a man, right? He's the son of man. He's the son of God and the son of man. And so are you. You're the son of God and you are the son of man. When it says, let us make man, it's anthropos, that's species, right? And then he said he made them male and female, not just male and then female as afterthought. No, male and female. They're both made in God's image and likeness. Okay. As high priest, he fully identifies with us in the context of our frail human lives, having what subjected the flesh to close scrutiny, proves that the human frame was master over sin. Remember sin, hamartia without form and lot of portion, believing a lie about ourselves that we are not in the image and likeness of God. Adam, that's what happened to Adam. He looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He redefined himself, but he was still in the image and likeness of God. He still was an image bearer of Elohim, but he passed that down to us. So that's what sin is. So it's not all the mistakes. The mistakes come from eating of that tree. That's the fruit of the tree. He proves that the human frame was master over sin. His sympathy with us is not to be seen as an excuse for weakness, which are the result of a faulty design. You are not a faulty design. You are made perfect by God himself in Christ Jesus. But rather a trophy to mankind. For this reason, we, we can approach the authoritative throne of grace with bold utterance. I mean, because we're face-to-face. -face. We're in union with Christ right now. And Christ is face-to-face -face with the Father. So guess where you are? Face-to-face -face with the Father. We are, wel uh, but, 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 but. we are welcome there in his embrace and are reinforced, all that reinforced with immediate effect in times of trouble. When there's trouble, it doesn't change anything. As he is, 1, uh, 1, 1 John 4, uh, 17, yeah. As he is, so are we in the world. Anyway, on to the next chapter. I'm going to flip over to the scripture that I want to pull up. It's got some scandalous stuff in it. And I like scandalous things. Anyway. So, remember, this is not written in chapter and verse. It's a letter. But it's been put, placed in chapter and verse. So the, so the thought continues to go. I love traditionally, a person would be appointed. Because I'm just going to talk about two priesthoods. The one of Melchizedek and one of Aaron. And then he gets into Melchizedek big time in the seventh chapter, which is really cool. So remember that from the last time we did this. Traditionally, a person would be appointed from among their fellows to fulfill the office of high priest in presenting what? Gifts and sacrifices. That's the, the job before God on behalf of the people and for their own sins. And, what, and what's the point of it? To get God's favor and, and you know, get your sins forgiven. Every Jew felt reassured by the fact, why, that the high priests themselves were hemmed in by the same sins that ensnared the people they represented. In other words, they should be able to relate to me because they have the same problems. Even though they're high priests, even though they've been given an honor, they can relate to me. By virtue of their own limitations and 
inadequacies. They were able to what sympathize with the ignorance and the waywardness of the people under them. They could sympathize, okay? He's setting all this up for a high priest. It was accepted practice that they would offer both sacrifices for both their own sins and the people's sins. The honorable office was not by self-appointment, but in an Aaron's case, the priest was summoned by, to the work of God. He's setting up that Christ is the high priest. And isn't it interesting, in the prophetic, he is the high priest, and he's also the sacrificial lamb. I mean, the, the prophetic in the Old Testament of who Christ is, and it was really given to the Jewish people, so they would recognize Messiah when he came. But in John, it says, it says he came to his own, and his own didn't want to recognize him. Out of deep, dense darkness has come a great light. They're, they have the Old Testament, and they're in deep, dense darkness. Neither did Christ assume a high, a high priestly office by his own presumption. In other words, I'll just do it. But in fulfillment of a prophetic word, remember, a foretelling word, a prophecy that he would be the high priest. Concerning the Messiah, in which God, speaking through David, said, You are my son. Today I have begotten you, which means to birth you. To begot something is to produce the same species of whatever beget it. That's why you are, you're all here human beings. You beget of other human beings. Dog begets dogs. Kangaroos beget kangaroos. God begets, you know, my fingers, little gods. That's why Jesus said, don't you know you're little gods? Psalms 82, John 10, you're little gods. But he's the son of God. He begot him, birthed him. All right. Just as he has spoken in other scriptures concerning this new priestly order, a new priestly order, not like the one they're used to, but it's foretold in scripture. Thou art a priest, thou art, a little King James in there, thou art a priest forever after the order of what? Melchizedek. Ooh, we got two priestly orders here going on. We got the Levitical priestly order, and then we got the, we got the Melchizedek who came to Abraham, and, and we're going to probably get into that a little bit more in the seventh chapter. We got two priestly orders. He's trying to make the defense here that Jesus is the high priest. And he didn't, he didn't try to earn it. It was given to him. It's prophesied of him. All right, and, the, and the, a little bit in the uh, commentary. By translation, king of righteousness. Now, I think it's king of Salem, king of peace, king of righteousness. King of righteousness. The scripture, the scriptures, a new and eternal order of priesthood is introduced. Priesthood was prophesied in scripture. A priesthood neither passed on by natural birth nor ending with a natural death. In other words, just like Jesus, he's got no beginning and no end. He's a priest forever. In the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning, no end. He's like one, like the Son of Man, the Son of God. All right. We got through almost half the scriptures already, but now we're, I'm going to start digging a little bit. So this is some good stuff in here. When he faced the horror of, it, of his imminent death, he presented his plea to God in an outburst of agonizing emotions and with tears. He prayed with urgent intent to be delivered from death. It doesn't say he prayed with urgent intent to get out of it. He prayed with urgent intent to deliver from death, knowing God's power was saving him and that he enjoyed God's full attention. He had a firm grip on the prophetic word and did God Deliver him from death? Yes, three days later. Three days later, he delivered him from death. Now, I'm going to read the, the uh, commentary, then I'm going to deviate a little bit. on Something that most of you probably hear know, but some of you may not. Not because he feared, as some translations have put it, but because he fully grasped that he was a he. Christ was a fulfillment of scriptures. Remember, he said, you seek the scriptures diligently, he said to the Jews, because you think in them you have eternal life, and those scriptures speak of me. He knew that he would be raised on the third day. Now, Luke 22. This is interesting. This is the mirror. Saying, Father, if you so desire to take away the weight of this cup from me. Now, listen to this. This is a mirror translation. 
by bearing it alongside me. Saying, Father, if you so desire to take away the weight of this cup from me, how? By bearing it alongside me so that we can get it over and done with. Nevertheless, I'm fully submitting my wish to you. And verse 44, where it talks about sweating blood, here's Francois' commentary. Ready? These verse, verses were absent in the most ancient manuscripts and widely diversified witnesses. It was clear a later addition to the text to add a dramatic detail. However, the drama of the cross and its unparalleled significance to human history can never be exaggerated. In other words, he's saying in the old transcript, he did not sweat blood. Take it for what it's worth. I just thought that was interesting. It doesn't matter to me, by the way, if he sweat blood or if he did not. So the, then the, the other issue is, uh, did God turn his back on Jesus? That's always the big one. And many of you know this stuff, but for the people who don't, I think it's so incredible that Jesus says on the cross, and he's quoting Psalms 90 or 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from my words and my groaning? It's the cry of Adam. And like many people believe, now when he says that, that's a song. You know, sometimes we say the Psalms and we forget that they're songs. It's the song of the cross. And every Jew would know this one. So you, many of you heard this, but you have it. If I sang amazing grace, all of a sudden in your head, what's well, all sweet, this song. So when he starts off there, that's a song. And the rest of the words would start to go through their head. Wow. And here he is. That's the song of the cross. And he's on the cross. Do you recognize me? And of course, everybody says that's where God turned his back on him. And that's kind of what my point here. Verse 24 says, for he has not despised or abhorred the afflicted of the affliction. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. In other words, he didn't turn his back. And then I'm going to just flip a, more, a couple more scriptures here. Because 1 Corinthians, where are we here? Or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, It was God all the while present in Christ, reconciling the world to, word to, himself, world to himself. I mean, did he reconcile the world or not? Or did he reconcile only part of it or 10% of it or 50% of it? How much did he reconcile? And then uh, what, uh, John 16, verse 32. Then suddenly, Jesus says, then suddenly you will all scramble, he's talking to his disciples, and run for your lives and abandon me. This is John 16, 32. But I am never forsaken because my father is always with me. So when people say he turned his back, don't think so. And I know many of you know that, but it's still good to bring up. So that's interesting when he says that. And it, when he faced the horror of his imminent death, he presented his plea to God. In all bursts of agonizing emotions with uh, tears, he prayed with urgent intent to be delivered from death, knowing God's power was saving him, and that he enjoyed God's full attention. And he never turned his back. He had a firm grip on the prophetic word, which is interesting because last night when I was praying with my sister Lucy, the sword of the spirit came up. In other words, in other words, he's got faith, doesn't he? He sees the prophetic. He's not being controlled by the senses, by all the pain and the suffering he's going to go through. He's being controlled, just like in uh, Hebrews 4.12. He's being controlled by the spiritual realm. This is what's going to happen. And think about it. Nobody, nobody's ever seen anybody raised from the dead in three days. I mean, think what's going through his mind. He knows everybody mystically is in union with him. He knows when he dies, everybody dies. He knows when he's raised from the dead, everybody's raised. And he knows when he ascends, everybody ascends mystically. And he knows when he dies, he's paying for the sins of the world. This is what, this is a, this is what he's, he's seeing this faith. Just like Abraham, he's, he's seeing in the spirit what's going on. And he's ignoring the stuff in the flesh, which is next, really the next verse, I believe. Acquainted with sonship. I love that word. Acquainted with sonship. So I got to read. A, okay, I'll, I'll read the verse. I just was pulling a lot of scriptures for all of these things. Acquainted with sonship. He was in the habit of hearing from above. 
acquainted with sonship. He is acquainted with sonship. The question is, are you and I acquainted with sonship? I hope so. He's acquainted with sonship. He was in the habit of hearing from above. And that which he heard distanced himself from the effects of what he had to suffer. The scripture, I think, is, is it Hebrews 12, 3, it says, or 12, 2, it says, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, ignoring and despising all the shame. Ooh, he distanced himself from the things he suffered. He was so tuned in as an active hearer of the Father that he distanced himself from the chaos that was going to happen. The word often translated as obedience is the word upoakau, and I do not know how to pronounce this. I'm taking a swing at it. Under the influence of hearing, hearing from above, hearing from above, by the things he suffered away from, distance himself, okay? So let's see here. I just want to look at Romans 8.15 really quick. Let me flip over here. I just love I'm having fun going on. I love to run the scripture. so much fun. It says, this is the mirror. Slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship because he says, acquainted with sonship. Are we acquainted with sonship? And the answer is yes, we are. And if we're not, we need to get acquainted with sonship because we are his sons and daughters. He is living in us. We are birthed from above. We're not born again. We're born from above. The sl slavery is such a poor substitute for sonship. They are opposites, sonship and slavery. The one leads forcefully through fear, while sonship responds adoringly to Abba. It's a romance. It's a romance. Father, adoringly. We are not slaves to a cruel taskmaster, but gifted with the spirit of sonship. Engaging the tender affection of Papa without any reserve. Say, I am engaging the tender affection of my Father God, Papa Abba, without reserve. Not just a little of it, all of it. Holy Spirit personally entwines our spirit, resonating ceaselessly within endorsing Abba's parenthood. I love this. He's acquainted with sonship, but I like to bring it back to us. We need to get more acquainted with sonship if we're not. All right. Verse 9. I love this. By his perfect hearing, he forever, by his perfect hearing, I love that word, forever. I like to make the, you know, sometimes it's so easy to read over these words and not get the gist of it, the pound, forever. Because of his perfect hearing, he forever freed. He forever freed mankind to hear what he heard. Say this, by his perfect hearing, he is forever, forever freed me to hear what he heard. Wow. Acquainted with sonship. Active here. Freeing me forever to hear what he heard. Giving me the mind of Christ. His very mind. Wow. Dwelling in me. Making me his temple. Father, Son, Spirit all dwelling in me. Second, First Corinthians 2 says the Spirit is, is searching the bottomless things that God is sharing. What? The thoughts of God with me and you all the time. Wow. The authority of this, okay, of this high priestly order of Melchizedek flows where? Directly from God. That's where it flows. Not from Aaron down to Levi and all the way through. It flows from God, the order of Melchizedek. No beginning, no end. Like I said, chapter 7 really goes into it. Isn't this fun? Man, this word is awesome. Just like, wow, just impact. I mean, you always got to bring it back to Christ, but Christ, remember, the Old Testament's all about Christ, and Christ is all about you. He's not an example for you. He's an example of you. He's the son of God, son of man. So are you. He's the very blueprint of your design, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And as you behold him as in a mirror, you're what? Transfigured. And that's the opposite word of sin, metamorph or hamatia, metamorpho, together with his form. Image and likeness redeemed in you already. And you, us, what? Wrapping our minds around what God did. 
and you know what? We need faith for that, don't we? I mean, there's contradictions. In fact, I want to, I just, uh, I just want to flip over to, the Holy Spirit brought me over to the Ephesians, the sixth chapter, about the, just the, the uh, shield of faith. But listen to this, because remember, it's faith, isn't it? Beyond the contradiction. If everything lined up exactly the way we, you know, we wouldn't need any faith, would we? But what pleases God? Faith. The testing your faith produces what? Endurance. Sometimes you got to wait for something and believe. That produces endurance, doesn't it? Listen to what he says. It is most important to engage your faith, your persuasion, as a man-sized shield that covers your whole person and empowers you to do what? Extinguish, extinguish the flame in every area of every arrow of contradiction, everything that you could, all the enemy, of, well, this isn't true because of this is, no, it's true because he says so. I'm lining up and seeing myself, how Christ sees me. Perfect, holy, sinless, beloved, image bearer, temple. Because he says it. Well, this happens. I know it did, but that's how he sees me. Who's right, me? The little thoughts are him. He's right all the time. The only visible part of, of you is your faith. Say this, the only visible part of me is my faith. That's a faith statement. I can feel that that is not true, but it's true. Whether you feel it or not, your feelings have nothing to do with it. All right, 11. On this subject, I love this, because we have a professor in our midst, Keisha. I love Keisha. The professor of chemistry, and that's pretty impressive. I keep saying that, but it is pretty impressive. On this subject, there remains so much to be said. Now, listen to what he's saying. This is the Jewish people. Hold it one second here. Here, let me look. Just give me a second here. I know I'm losing my mind, but it'll come back sometime. I'm just going to read. I'm, I'm going to come back. I just want to read uh, Hebrews 6 1 and then come back to this. Consequently, as difficult as it may seem, you ought to divorce yourself from the sentimental attachment to the foreshadowing doctrine of Messiah. Divorce yourself from it. Now look what he says here. On this subject, there remains so much to be said, but how, but oh, how difficult it is to explain something to someone who hears with indifferent attitude, who doesn't give a, I won't say it, you can fill in the blank. Scubula, doesn't give, doesn't give a scubula you know the Greek, who hears with indifferent attitude. Now listen to what he says. He's talking to the Jewish people. These, many of these are believers. He says, by now, you Jews should have been professors. A professor is someone that teaches other professors, students, colleges, master students, PhD people. You know, and he says teachers in the other Testament and the elementary things, but he says professors. I mean, he's showing you a distinction. Man, you should be the, the top of the game here, able to teach the rest of the world, but you are still struggling with first grade. The ABCs of God's messianic language. It's a new language. It's not a law language. It's a messianic language. It's a faith language. He says, you're struggling. You ought to be PhD people by now and teaching the world, but you're indifferent. And because of it, you don't even, you're struggling with ABCs. First grade you're struggling with. I mean, that's it's kind of a slam, really. The difference, no, this is, because we hear this all the time. Oh, the meat of the word. Usually when they, I hear, I mean, I haven't been around in a long time in the churches, but when I hear the meat of the word, they usually go into like legalism and some deep thing that you need to do to get better. But listen to this. This is so awesome. The difference between the prophetic shadow, which is the old covenant, a shadow system, a rude outline. Light hits it, it blocks something, we see a root outline. The shadow system, the prophetic shadow is the real, and the real is the, between milk and meat. The milk is the old covenant. The meat is the new covenant. Meat in your diet. You cannot live on baby food for the rest of your life. Because in other words, what did they want to do? They want to hold on to their traditions. Hold on to the old covenant. And he says, divorce yourself from it. Move on. Move on to faith. And not only that, not only, you know, you look at some versions, I mean, Paul's fighting the Judaizers, people that believed in Jesus and came into the Gentile churches. And like Galatian, what did they do? They started saying, well, you need to do this to be saved. You need to do this to please God. You need to get circumcised. You need to 
be the Sabbath. You need to, you need to, right? They brought the law covenant. Actually, that's what happens. That's what happened to the church. That's why our church is powerless. That's why it, church, the churchianity is powerless. I could go into that. I love that. Galatians 3, just read it. It's powerless. God honors faith. It's all a gift. We receive it by faith. We're perfectly pleasing. But do we do things? Yes, because we're responding to our Father, Abba, Father, fondly. Abba, Father. Just like falling in love with your first, your first person you fell in love with. Man, you were crazy, weren't you? Maybe you weren't, but I want to talk to him all the time. I want to buy him stuff. I want to be with him all the time. I want to sit next to him. I want to touch him. I want to do this. I want to kiss his face. I mean, and what did you do? Your life just radically changed. Effortlessly, by the way. It would burn within. Same with our romance with God. And when you get into the legalism, then it's a duty system. It takes all the joy out of it. And that's the problem. And that's the problem with this. He's trying to bring them out. And Paul's trying to, try to for the Galatians, he's trying to say, hey, don't do that. The church has been Galatianized, unfortunately. That's, that's just the truth. It's a truth you can say it. Anyway, but now you Jewish, okay, I read that. Verse 13, I tell you what, this is when you should meditate on. The revelation, which is the unveiling of righteousness, is the meat of God's word. It's not some higher thing that you have to do and how much time you have to spend and this and that. It's what God did on the cross. Babes live on milk. And first part of chapter six talks about that. The milk is the old shadow system. So when sometimes people get up and start telling me it's meat, I go, hey, it sounds like milk to me. Not meat. Meat is the revelation of the gospel. The revelation of righteousness through Christ Jesus, which is by what? Faith. And you heard me say this. I'll say it again. Before I even got the mirror, before I even knew any of this stuff, I knew this. You're righteous by faith, and that's the best thing you could be, and you can't. I mean, how can you add to that? So why would you try? Why don't you just enjoy your righteousness that came from where? It came from God. Romans 3.23, all of sin falls short of the glory of the Lord. Romans 28 or 3.24, all have been made righteous as a free gift by Jesus Christ. The, the verse no one ever reads. The missing verse. And ask anybody, do you know what comes after that? No, I don't. You should, because you just read the bad news. The good news comes next. He says, so does everyone who is not pierced in the heart of the revelation of Christ. Heaven, heaven the revelation of righteousness, which is the simplicity of the message. It's a simple message. Now I'm going to deviate up a little bit. I hope I'm too long here, but I just want to go to Isaiah 55, or 51, excuse me. I don't. Isaiah 51, listen to this. Because when we talk about the revelation of righteousness. Hearken to me, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. Who seek and inquire of the Lord. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah who gave birth to you. When he was one, I made him many. In other words, he was one Person with a barren wife, postmenopausal, and he made him what many. He did exactly what he promised. He says, "If you can count the stars, count the sands, you can count your descendants." And I love this part because this is this is the truth. When you believe this way, when you come to this recognition of righteousness by faith, and you've done nothing to accomplish it, and you're perfectly pleasing, this is what happens. For the Lord will comfort you. He comforts all your waste places. He makes your wilderness like Eden, woohoo, and your desert like the garden of the Lord, joy and gladness. Let me say it again, joy and gladness are found in you in thanksgiving and voices of songs of instruments of praise when you find and you let all the burdens of all the nonsense we've been doing and so they just receive what he did for us. Remember in Genesis 15, he said, you know, how can you give me some stuff? And the only person I have is Eleazar, my, and my, uh, my servant to give it to you. No, he says, there'll be one from your body. He says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to his account as righteousness. And now I want to flip over to Rome. Romans, the fourth chapter. I love, I, I just love the word. 
Scripture is clear. Abraham, if we are looking, if we look at our father Abraham as an example and scrutinize his life, would you say that he discovered any reason for placing confidence in the flesh? Would you say he, no, or personal accomplishments? No. If he felt that his friendship with God was a reward for good behavior, then surely he would have reason to recommend the recipe. Five steps to a relationship with God. Five steps to righteousness. Yet it is plain to see that it was all God's initiative from start to finish. It was God initiating this relationship. It was God initiating this relationship with you through Christ. Redeeming and reconciling the world to himself. To embrace the world. This is the God of love that loves the world. Not cursing the world. Not trying to get rid of the world. The scripture is clear. Abraham believed what God believed about him. And he, and that concluded his righteousness. It concluded, it finished it. And it manifests something too, didn't it? And manifests a child who was beyond all, Romans 4.20, all hope being God, hope in faith. I mean, he had a barren postmenopausal woman, not just a barren woman. That was bad enough. In postmenopause, God waited until it was all hope being God in the flesh. Okay, Romans 1. Starting in 17. Maybe uh, I'm losing my mind. I'm sorry. Herein lies the secret. Remember the revelation. It says the revelation of righteousness is the meat of God's word. Herein lies the secret of the power of the gospel, which is the well done announcement. Here's the power. There's no good news in it until the righteousness of God is revealed. Woo. Same scripture revealed the dynamic or the power of the gospel is the revelation of God's faith as the only ballot basis for what uh, for our belief the prophets wrote in advance about the fact that God believes that righteousness reveals what the life of our design your image and likeness Elohim bearers image bearers righteousness by God's faith defines us in other words God defines us and now, down in the commentary there if I can find it I know I can the word righteousness comes from the Anglo-Saxon word right wise us. Remember, it's his right way that we're depending on, not ours. He did what he did right. Let's see here. Get back to that. The Greek word for righteous, and I'm, I, like I said, I don't know the proper pronunciation, but I'm going to take a swing at it. Diko asune from DK, that which is right. It is a relationship word and refers to two parties finding likeness in each other. Righteousness points to a harmony in relationship, a oneness. In other words, God, when God sees you, he sees his image and likeness. He sees you holy, righteous, pure, temple, dwelling place, image bearer. That's how he sees you. And he wants you to see yourself by faith the same way he sees you. Beyond the contradiction. That's why you need the shield of faith. So when those little... You remember it says the, the flaming arts of the contradiction, or it says in other versions, the devil, which is the word diabolo, because of the fall, the fallen mindset. We thought, well, it can't be because of, no, it is because God says so. And that's, that's the truth. And I'll, da, 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 da. Actually, and I'll just say one more scripture. I had a bunch of them written down because I could go on with this. But, you know, in Romans, the fifth chapter, it says, because of one man's fall and offense, all became sinners. Because of one man's act of righteousness, righteousness spread to what? All men. All men. Say, because of Christ's act of righteousness, righteousness came to me. Because of Adam's sin, sin flowed to us. Because of Christ's act of righteousness, righteousness flowed to us. Image and likeness. God came to redeem his image and likeness in you in the flesh and to dwell in you. And he's dwelling in you now. You're his temple. Skenos, in the Old, Old Testament, the Greek says that the temple is skenos. That sounds like skin. It was made of skin. The symbolism where he's dwelling, that was, that was the last chapter. That was fantastic, by the way. All right. That was some good stuff, isn't it? Verse 14. This is the nourishment of the mature, the doctrine of righteousness, being acquainted with sonship. All God, all a gift, all by promise. Just receive it by simply believing. 
And yes, you will do good works because you can't help it. And yes, you'll quit doing some stupid things because you won't desire it. Because, I mean, think about this. What are people looking for anyway? Peace, love, and joy. Where's it all at? In relationship with the Father, Son, Spirit. So when you have that, all, maybe those other things aren't as like alluring anymore. Because you've got joy bubbling out of you. Peace. And you're loving, first of all, you're loving, you're seeing how God loves you, so you're starting to love yourself. And that consequently flows to loving other people and seeing them differently and how God sees them. This is the nourishment of the mature, the revelation of righteousness. They are the ones, we are the ones, who have our faculties of perception trained as gymnastic precision to distinguish the, re the relevant from the irrelevant. And there's a lot of irrelevant out there. Okay, commentary. The mature are those who know the difference between the shadow and the substance. Remember, is it uh, 11th chapter? Faith is the substance. Christ is the substance of things hoped for. You have a shadow, all of a sudden you see Christ in the shadow. Woo, he's the substance of things we hope for and the evidence of things not seen before. But he shows up. He's the final word, the incarnation. That's the first verse in 11. Between the futility of the law of works, futility, waste of time of the law of works, and the and the willpower to work righteousness, and righteousness revealed by the faith of God in what? The finished work of the cross. That's good enough for me. 